Welcome to Crime Most French, a fortnightly podcast covering intriguing cases carried out on French soil. Researched and narrated by Cedric and rudely interrupted by me, Melanie. We're the true crime podcast on the lines. Crack open the van and let the mayhem commence. This week's episode is episode 61, Issei Sagawa, the Paris Cannibal. Yeah, this is probably not the podcast to be listening to when you're eating your breakfast. Or dinner. Or or, or lunch. No. It's a very famous story. Most people would have heard some of that anyway. Mm. But I wanted to know a little bit more about the details. It's it's certainly been covered to death on YouTube. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But in 15 minutes or 20 minutes, we can't really go into details. So in June 1981, a body is discovered with missing flesh, it will become the infamous case of the Paris cannibal. On the 13th of June 1981, a couple is working in the Bois de Boulogne in Paris. Paris has two wood areas, Mm -hmm. very big ones, uh, Bois de Boulogne in the southwest and Bois de Vincennes in the southeast. The Bois de Boulogne by the 80s was pretty much taken over by night prostitution. Before that, in the 70s, it was mostly stabbings and muggings. So it was so kind of an improvement, but not great. So we're talking kind of like Central Park, kind of like skeeviness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. It's better now, but in the 80s, it was pretty yeah. bad. Uh, when you drove in uh, Bois Boulogne at night, it was like rows and rows of uh, women and transvestites as well on the sides looking for business, so... So that's where we are at the moment in 1981. Right. So peak uh, a place you wouldn't really want to go at night. Yes. It was at a transition between the muggings and the prostitution. Okay. There's a couple walking in uh, in one of the roads. That seems strange that you would go out for a walk. Yeah, but it was a warm uh, June night right. and people do it. And it was probably not that late. I think it was still, it's June, so it yeah, would be so the, the bright until long. like, yeah, yeah, very late. So at that point, it probably wasn't, the prostitutes weren't out yet, I suspect. So it was still okay to walk. There's lots of people going into the wet wet building during the day because it has loads of lakes, several lakes. You can take boats and and stuff. Family just goes there during the day, but it's at night that it was nasty. So at that point, it was probably early enough in the evening that it was still bright. It was still okay to be be on the road there. So they walk in, uh, in the park and they see a taxi stop ahead of them, and they described a small, slender, Asian-looking man jumping out, dragging two large suitcases out of the boot. And to them it was a bit strange, because there's nothing there that would justify arriving with suitcases. So it's, like, there's no hotel, there's no house, yeah. there's absolutely nothing. It's, it's woodland. Yeah. So they couldn't understand why that guy would jump out of a taxi and took two suitcases out, yeah. and then left they, they thought it was very very strange i mean i mean holiday time in in paris um whether it's kind of like spring or all of summer or autumn there are just swathes of people going around with suitcases so i mean it really yeah. isn't unusual to see people with suitcases but in a wooded but area woods, that is yes. very very weird that is very weird so they thought it was strange mm. and they keep watching because they thought, okay, well, I want to know what he's doing now. Yeah. I'm intrigued. The small Asian man put the suitcases on the trolley of some sort right. that he brought with him and pushed it into the woods. I'll tell you what, he's going to get done for excess baggage, clearly. Yes. <laughs> oh, it was the 80s, you could have two suitcases at the time. Oh, yeah, that's true. So the couple also saw him suddenly turn to one side and start walking towards one of the lakes. Right. And they, su- they immediately suspected... Those suitcases are going in the lake. He was going to dump the suitcases in there, yeah. And, and let's face it, if you're throwing stuff in a lake, there, there's something bad happened before that. You're up to no good. Yes. Yeah. So at that point, the Asian man turned around and obviously was checking if nobody was watching mm. and he spotted the couple watching him. Uh-oh. So... He stopped and panicked. He dumped the suitcases under a bush and ran off. Right. So he didn't... He didn't even put them in the do lake. the job properly no. then. No, no, he just panicked and ran away. So the couple was very, very intrigued at that point. They yeah. wanted to know. So 
they went to where the suitcases were. Oh, my God. Of course. Well, that's what you do. No, this is... You can totally tell it's the 80s. If I've ever... If I would ever come across a black bag or a suitcase or a big box in the middle of nowhere where it shouldn't be, there is no way I am opening it. None. Well, that was obviously a different era. Yeah. So, after the, the Asian man left, they went to the bush. Mm-hmm. And pulled one of the suitcases out. I opened it. And at that point, their evening is ruined because they discover a woman's torso. Yeah. Well, you get what you deserve, to be quite frankly honest with you. When you're opening stuff, it has nothing to do with you. I mean, I would have reported it to the police saying... What they do at that point. Well, yeah, but I would have reported it prior to it being opened. Uh, Yeah, 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 okay. So they, they call the police, obviously, mm. and they come very quickly, and they confirm that, yes, indeed, the suitcase contained a woman's torso. In the other suitcase, they discover limbs and a head. What? So, uh, so, so can we rewind? They opened both the suitcases? No, the cops did. Oh, the cops did. I got what you say. No, no, so they, the, they the torso the wasn't one. enough for them to see. Yeah, they yeah, no, wanted no. to confirm. After the first suitcase, they understood that that was it. Yes. <laughs> No, the really didn't need to know the cop. Well, fair enough, yeah, yeah. fair enough. So they have uh, what they think is probably a whole woman. They assume that the limbs mm. and the head belong to the same torso, but right. they're not sure at that point. They move the remains to the morgue immediately. You don't really want to alarm citizens, I guess. And there, after having reassembled the body again, the pathologist discovers a bullet hole at the base of the skull. Right. So not natural causes. Presumably, that's how the woman died. Mm. At the same time, when you discover a dismembered body, you can assume that it wasn't natural causes. No, I guess not. I guess not. But, but at least, at least it kind of like points to the the poor person, you know, being dispatched quite quickly rather than being tortured or something. If if you found a bullet wound, yeah. But also, the pathologist noticed that there were missing portions of flesh mm-hmm. on the body. Right. Like they had been sliced off. Okay. So there's parts of the ass missing, part of, part of the thighs, as well as part of the nose missing. Really? Yes. And also, um, that I don't know if it was reported at the time, but also one of the breasts was removed. Oh, no, that's nasty. That's pretty nasty, yes. So they start an inquiry immediately because they want to know what's going on. And they had... A few solid leads from the start that were kind of lucky because the the couple who witnessed the scene gave good description of everything they they saw. Uh And so they were looking for a small Asian man that had arrived in a taxi. So obviously what you you do is you start by calling all the taxi companies and say, okay, who picked up an Asian man and dropped him off in the middle of the woods? Who was working that day? I mean, that's yes. a, it's a big job, isn't it? It is a fairly big job, yes. Um, and there were probably thousands of Japanese or Asian yes. tourists in Paris at oh, the yes. time because it's June. It's June, yes. So, yeah, it probably brought a number of possibilities, mm. but not many were dropped off no. in the middle of the woods. No, as you say, going, go, going to the woods with suitcases is just exactly. very, very suspicious. So they call all the taxi companies and... They at first don't find the right one, but a few days later, a taxi driver comes forward and say, I remember I dropped off a Japanese guy in the middle of the Bois de Boulogne and I picked him up Rue Erlanger, which is in the posh 16th uh, district. Oh, Chiching. And it's very close to the park. In fact, it borders the park. Mm-hmm. So the, the ride was very short. And... 16th district for Americans is Greenwich Village, and for um, Brits, it's Notting Hill, essentially. Okay. So Or Shoreditch. Very, very posh. Yes. And very expensive. So he remembers that. So they think, okay, well, that, that has to be the guy. So they go to where he was picked up, and they start looking around. And mm-hmm. they start asking, do you, you know an Asian man living around here? And there weren't many living in that area, because, of course, he wasn't a tourist. No. So they eventually found people and say, oh, yeah, 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 there's a guy living up that building there, which is exactly where he was picked up. He was picked up in front of the door. So they go in and they're very careful because bullet hole in the head. Yeah. So they know he has a gun. Mm. 
So they're very careful. So you can imagine, um, if you know the police forces, it's essentially a SWAT team that turned up. They're not knocking on the door politely, are they? They did. They did. They didn't break everything and like a SWAT team do, would do. Mm. They were very polite, but very, very careful. There I was one guy knocking cop- politely, but there was big dudes with big, huge guns oh, yeah, 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 yeah. right yeah, behind exactly. him. Yeah, and yeah. armor and everything. Of course. But the remember also that uh, for Brits in in France, all cops have guns as yes. well. They have a, a handgun, yes. all of them. For Americans, it's not surprising, but for Brits, it is. No. So there was a lot of guns in that building on that oh, day. Oh, I'd imagine, yeah. But they went in and they knocked at the door and they discover a Japanese guy opening the door. He was five foot, six stone, and he was very cooperative. It's five foot and six stone? Yes, he's I very small. I suddenly feel very overweight. Six he, stone? Yeah, he is Hoochie very... Hoochie mama. Very slender, slender. But at that point, they know who he is. He's Issei Sagawa. God, I must be about 80 pounds. I'm still thinking about his weight, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Typical woman. <laughs> At that point, Sagawa had been in a paranoid delirium for about 48 hours. Yeah. Because he knew he had gone done wrong. He knew he had been seen. And he was expect- expecting the police to turn up at his door at any point, at any minute. Right, okay, so he... he... He's obviously in a high state of anxiety, but he's not... I wouldn't have called it a delirium if you're expecting consequences for something that you've done. He he was totally panicked for 48 hours. Right. So in that heightened state, then yes, I guess yes. You can, some kind of psychosis would kick yeah. in. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was expecting the yeah. cops to, to He turn was up waiting for the merd to, yeah, to hit, hit the, the fan. fan. Yeah. So when he heard the doorbell, he mm, knew what that he was. Knew. And that's why he was cooperating, because right. there was... No point explaining why the cops were there. He knew. Yes. Sagawa arrived in Paris in 1977 to do a PhD in literature at La Sorbonne. All right, okay. He is clearly from money. Yeah. And that's where he met René Hartevelt, who's a Dutch student who also came to Paris to study literature. That's the victim. Right. Poor lady. He, he was instantly attracted to her, obviously. Uh, yeah. She matched perfectly her ideal woman. Unfortunately, the 25-year-old woman didn't pay attention to the 32-year-old Japanese man. What, the 32-year-old Japanese man that if you sneezed too hard near would actually probably blow away? Yeah, yeah yes. It, she was fat foot 10 as well. He so had a, a good uh, amount taller than him. He, he, he must have thought she food. was Godzilla, for goodness sake. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But they they shared lectures at the university. Right. And became obsessed with her. One afternoon, Sagawa found himself face to face with her in the subway. That was total chance. And they started talking. And he sat next to her and they had discussions about literature and and all that. And she recognized him from from the lectures. Well, it must be quite distinctive. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, let's face it, probably... Most of the people who she was kind of surrounded with would have been French. Yeah, 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 totally, mm. yeah. So they started talking about courseworks. They started to ca- talking about uh, various uh, literature and whatever. Mm-hmm. So she was interested in discussion because Sagawa is very intelligent and very erudite. So he knows a lot. He can talk about anything literature-wise yeah. for hours and hours and hours. I mean, if you're coming to the Sorbonne, uh, so you're doing... I mean, he's I like suspect you. they don't let anyone in. You have to prove that you're the right person it, for the course. Yes. That's exactly right. I mean, yeah. you went to um, Scotland and did all of your PhD in, yes. a, in a second language. But, you know, yes. Napier wasn't quite as uh, as choosy as a Sorbonne, yes. I guess. So I mean, he's obviously very, a really, you know, clever guy. Yes, he is. So they talk a lot. Um, he's very shy and reserved. Mm-hmm. And that's essentially how they really met, even though they had kind of met during lectures at university. Yeah. They hadn't really talked before. Aren't most Japanese people really kind of quiet and respectful and quite shy? I, I don't know. Can't really tell. Uh, I, I, would, I would question that assessment. They're, they're, they're very, you know... But like, they're very distant, but yeah. that's not really the same as shy. So I, I don't know. I don't True. know. I don't know many... So I can't really Doesn't say. Doesn't do him, do him. <laughs> Bit of <a> racial uh, <laughs> profiling on him. Yes, but at, the, at that point, Sagawa knew what he wanted. <laughs> so after a later lecture, 
a group of students decided to go to a Greek restaurant and discuss of whatever course. they learned. They want to do the real cliched French yeah, thing exactly. of going to yeah. a certain type of restaurant, sitting around and being yeah. incredibly pretentious. So when that was discussed, Renée said that she was interested and she would go. So okay. Sagawa was over the moon, obviously. So, so he decided to go as well. Okay, safety in numbers, I guess. Yeah. To him, it was a way to further their relationship. Yeah. So during discussions, classmates expressed interest in Japanese cuisine. It's kind of obvious that it would be interesting because some of them uh, were studying uh, Oriental literature, mm -hmm. so in particular Japanese. Right. So, so they were interested, and he invited everybody to his flat later at a later date, so he could prepare sukiya, sukiyaki, it's meat with noodle, noodles, right, for them. Okay. On the day, all except one student turned up. Nasegawa wasn't entirely surprised because he knew that other students were finding him a bit weird and standoffish. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't expecting everybody to turn up, but only one turned up. And luckily it was Rene. Oh no. He was happy about that because that's what he wanted. So they chatted happily uh, that evening. There was no nothing weird. Sagawa was playing to his education, of course, and his taste. And they discussed like cuisine and classical music and literature and, and Rene loved it. It's all suddenly turned into an episode of Frasier. All that's, kind of. all that's missing is a dog yeah. in a bad uh, barker lounge. <laughs> yeah. Sagawa, at that point, considered attacking her right away right. In, her, in his flat. But he wasn't prepared because he didn't expect just her to turn up. Well, yes, that's true. Yes. So he wasn't prepared to, to do something about that. So he devised a new plan. If he could convince her to come back on her own again... Then he could have her. So the opportunity presented itself when Rene mentioned that she was fluent in three languages, German, English, and French. Mm -hmm. And she also mentioned that she, a bit short, she was a bit short on money. So Segawa thought, oh, I have an idea. He mentioned that he was interested in learning German. So she could Tutor teach him German, mm -hmm. and he could read German romantic poetry in the original text. Oh, nothing warms a heart more than German romantic yeah. poetry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So Ronnie was interested and she'd be happy to tutor him. Of course, she would make money out of it. So Yeah, of course. So they, they agreed to, to meet on a later date for that. Oh, I mean, you you know him. He's, you know, you've even eaten at his place, so, you know, his, yeah, yeah. his apartment. It's fine. Yeah, no reason yeah, to be you worried. You think normally yeah, yeah. this isn't just some kind of answering a skeevy ad in uh, Craigslist, this is, uh, or Gumtree, this yeah. is just, you know, someone you know. So yeah. she should be safe. So, yeah, and I'm not surprised she was, you know, jumping at it. She was needing the money. Yeah. So she came mm -hmm. at a later date when they had, they had agreed. But Sagawa got cold feet. He, he was dying to attack her, but he struggled to make the transition between fantasy and reality. So he really wanted to kill her, but at the same time he knew it was wrong and didn't want to do it. If this if this was a film, this would be the part where it would turn into some kind of like manga uh, inspired <laughs> fever dream. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. And I have been watching way too much true crime lately because you said when he he had cold feet, I almost interrupted you and said, well, not as cold as her feet are going to be. Yeah. But that would have been too dark and I'm quite clearly soulless. So he struggles to to act, mm -hmm. and eventually he just gives up, and they finish the evening, and she leaves the flat alive. So basically, um, presumably he wasn't listening, but she was, you know, at least giving him one full German lesson. Yeah, no, he was listening. She yeah. didn't notice that he was doing something else. It was just also saying in his head, okay, I want to kill her, and oh, I can't kill her. No. I'm telling you, there'll be the thought bubble and yeah. it would all be a manga fever dream of him carving her up. So Segawa was very unhappy with himself. Yeah. But they had agreed for another date so he could have another lesson. Mm -hmm. So he decided, this time I'm going to kill her. So that day came and as Rene was sitting on the floor on a cushion in his flat, reading German to him, he decided to act. So he went to the kitchen, he got the .22 long rifle that he had, remember, in the 80s, everybody had one in front. Mm. He was keeping it in a, in a cupboard. 
he struggled again with himself, trying to convince himself that he had to do it and actually do it. But eventually he found a resolve and he decided to kill her. So he pointed uh, the gun at her head right. and pulled the trigger. I'm very surprised he chose to use a, a, a big shotgun because, I mean... It's not that... a shotgun, it's a long rifle. It's a... Um, it, it is a rifle, so it, it's not a shotgun. It's much smaller, right. slender, longer. It, it's like a, well, the thing we have in the house. It looks like that, essentially. Right. So it wouldn't be like a, a, something that weighed almost the same as him then. It, it was yeah. something that he could wield quite easily. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was light and very uh, and easily available. Mm. But when he pulled the trigger, nothing happened. The gun jammed. All right. So he panicked. But he was at the same time relieved to see that Renee hadn't heard the click coming from behind her. That's weird. It's probably not that loud. I think it was still in the kitchen at that point, so it was in the different room. So it wasn't like point blank. It wasn't right behind no. her head. No. At that point, no. He was trying to kill her from a distance. Mm. So he returned the gun to the cupboard, cupboard because there's nothing else he could do. And he went back and sat next to her and pretend to listen to the German lesson. She had failed again. This, um, I could see Tarantino making quite a horribly decent film kind of based on something similar. Yeah. Or or the Coens. Mm-hmm. Or the Coens, definitely, mm-hmm. yes. Rune and Segawa agreed for another date for a third German lesson. Rune comes again. And once again, Segawa tries to put this plan in action. I hope he's had a look at the gun in the meantime, if he's really wanting to go through it. But he would, yes. So he went to the kitchen again when Rene was, wasn't paying attention, got the point two two again out of the cupboard and aimed at her head. This time, the gun worked. Oh, poor Rene. It made a hole at the base of her, of her skull. Right. She fell to the floor and blood starting to pull around her head. Mm. Sagawa, would, Sagawa would later say that he was so shocked by what he had done that he fainted at that point. Nobody knows if it's true, but that's what he said. Uh, to, is he trying to drum up sympathy because you've just no, I don't think so. snuffed out a very young, very... He never tried to to get sympathy for what he had done. No. He knew it was wrong. He never tried to, to say, oh, it's not my fault or anything like that. It's just when, when he was interrogated, we'll talk about it later, by the police, he was just answering all the questions. No, not obviously not lying. He was just honest with what he was saying. Yeah. So, I mean, you should, you should never quantify somebody's worth in life, but I mean, this was, you know, a bright woman. I mean, she's just yeah. three oh, languages. It's not relevant anyway. It doesn't make him more human. He's, no. he's, he's still a monster, but oh, yeah. he says that he fainted because he wasn't expecting that to happen. So he also apparently made an audio recording of her reading German poetry, then boom, shotgun, and then the noise of her, falling, falling, of her body falling down. Apparently that recording exists. Sagawa Why would anybody want to listen to that? What kind of a fucking monster. <laughs> Sagawa said that he regained, regained control of himself. Mm-hmm. He struggled to deal with what he had done. Because so far it had been fantasies. And now she was dead on his floor. Mm. So he had made the jump, but he was still struggling with it. So he had things that happened that went beyond what he had expected to really happen. But he didn't struggle for that long. <laughs> Very quickly he proceeded to undress her and bit one of her buttocks it wasn't a good way to proceed so he went back to the kitchen and got the sharpest sharpest carving knife that he had and he decided to start working on the dutch girl he described later that he sliced through a thin layer of yellow fat before he got to the red meat and he sliced a portion off and started chewing chewing on it and it described the taste as raw tuna fish You've put me off sushi now. <laughs> he thought that she tasted good at that point. So he turned turn her on her back and proceeded the same way uh, to cut off slices from her upper thigh and he ate it on the spot. Right. In a sort of trance, as he expl- explained, he un- completely undressed her and had sex with the corpse. But as well at that point. After that, he, it dawned on him that he had a problem because he had a breathing course of his living room floor. Yeah. So he needed to get rid of it. So he moved on his body to his bathtub and there, with the same knife, he started cutting bits. So cut off legs, arms, head and all that. So a lot of work. 
Uh, yeah, for the Nike struggled, apparently. Well, he I had mean, trouble cutting the head off. Well, yeah, I mean, what did you say? He's five foot? Yeah, he's five foot. So he's the same size as me and... He, she's uh, taller than me. <laughs> eh? She's taller than me. Yes. And, um, you know, the differential between their weights must have been big. Yeah. So during the whole process, he kept the tap running to get rid of the large the amounts blood. of blood coming right. out of the, the corpse. On the way, Saga, uh, Sagawa cut slices of buttock size and wrapped them in plastic and put them in his freezer for later. And he also took photos at every stage of the process, which they also exist. Over the next couple of days, he would leave his flat with Ronnie's clothes to dispose of them. Mm -hmm. And he only kept her trousers as a trophy. No idea why, but... Why would you keep the trousers? I, I don't know. Some, it's normally kind of like a piece of jewellery yeah, or something. Yeah, but that's what he decided to keep. He also purchased, purchased a couple of suitcases where he would put the body parts. I mean, really, if he was thinking, he should have done it uh, over more suitcases and uh, just did it when it was the, a more convenient time. Yeah. To and not, not by taxi. Never involved taxi. Oh, anyway. He's not a professional, remember? It's not something he does on a regular basis. Yeah, it's very true. At that point. He's not obsessed with true crime like I am. No. So, so to avoid raising suspicions, he went to the cinema with all their classmates. Right. During the two-day period. Mm -hmm. None of them suspected anything, obviously, because they had no idea that she was teaching him German. So they had no idea that he had, she had been to his flat. Right. And they found him relaxed and in good humor, according to what they said. Even though he was in a heightened state of panic yes. that he knew that the police... Yeah. So he's like a swan sailing across his life uh, yeah. from the outside, but inside he's a roiling mass of Yes, uh, and because he was distant from the others, they probably didn't notice that no, he was probably not. behaving slightly uh, differently. The same night he went back to the flat and ate some of Rene. This time he fried the meat. This time he found the meat tough and chewy, but he, he ate it anyway. But he didn't like it. Yeah, he must have overcooked uh, poor Rene. Possibly. There's no recipe, so... That's why you should never name cows. <laughs> <laughs> On Saturday night, he decided it was time to get rid of the remains. Because the body was starting to smell a bit. Oh, yeah. After 40 hours in pa Parisian yeah. heat. In June, yeah. As, as I often point out, Paris is on a bowl, so it really retains heat in the summer. And uh, yeah. All cities are normally warm in the summer, but uh, Paris is particularly bad for holding on to the daytime heat. Yes. So put, he put the body parts in his suitcase and went to the Bot Boulogne in a taxi. Mm -hmm. That's where we started. Yes. The w reason why he dumped the suitcases when he was watched by the couple, he explained at some point, was that he had committed to his plan and he decided to stick to it. So it didn't matter. Which is, they, they were It, it, it was important. totally stupid. Yes. He should have just taken the suitcases back. Yes. But no, he decided he would get rid of the suitcases there and then, so yeah. he did. But that was utterly stupid. But anyway, that's how he got caught. Mm -hmm. What the police eventually learned is that it wasn't the first time that he had tried to eat someone. Oh my God. When he was 24, while well, in, well, at university in Tokyo, Sagawa followed a German woman home. Then he broke into her flat as she was sleeping. And his intention at that point was to eat her by slicing bits of her buttocks and sneak away with some flesh. But she woke up, and when he attacked her, she defended herself. She pinned him down to the floor, because of course, remember, mm. he's five foot. She was German, probably a lot taller than him, mm. and obviously stronger than him. So at that point, he gave up and ran away. To me, psychologically, if I'm looking at it from a kind of like a clinical point of view, that it's, it's very telling that he's very small and and uh, he's short and very slight, and he's going for these tall Northern European women mm -hmm. who probably, you know, were a lot more not. I wouldn't say they would be fat, but they would be robust. Yes, and it's almost like he's trying to consume their kind of like their vitality and. Their, mm -hmm. their, the fact that they're kind of like a lot more healthy and uh, vital than he is. Yeah, we'll touch a little bit on that later. Okay. Um, so he was captured by the police mm -hmm. because she could give a good, a good description and he was charged with attempted rape. 
He never confessed. He, he was a charge. He, he was trying to eat her and he was... Yeah, but he never confessed to that. Oh, right. Okay. He and didn't have the knife and fork in his hand at exactly. the time. Right. So at that point, nobody knew he, his plan was cannibalism. Right. So he was charged, but the charges were dropped when Segura's father paid an unknown amount to the woman's family. I'm so tired of hearing about these privileged families buying their bloody kids out of. Mm. L- look at that Murdoch case, for God's sake. Oh, yeah. His son was responsible for the death of some poor young girl, and he served no time for it whatsoever. Yeah. Oh, it's infuriating. So at that point, he got away with what he tried to do, mm-hmm. but failed. Once in Paris in 77, before he met Rene, so mm. uh, he met Rene in 81, yeah. he moved to Paris in 77, he decided to try to realize his fantasy again by killing the easiest target he could find, a prostitute. He lured one to his flat and prepared to kill her while she was showering. But at that point, it was still early enough, he realized he just couldn't do it. Right. So he didn't do it. After that, between 77 and 80, he made several attempts again for his prostitutes again, but yeah. every time couldn't go through. I wonder if it, that was that move to Paris out of his environment and making it easier to, for him to be more detached from reality that made the actual... Well, given that he clearly had... Task easier. A type of women. Yes. He probably couldn't find that many in Tokyo. No. Whereas in Paris, he's mm. surrounded by them. Yes. So, yeah, probably, that probably mm. didn't help moving to Paris. Yeah. So, he goes to trial in Paris, obviously. Mm. Once again, his father paid for a very expensive lawyer. Of course. During interrogation, police found Saga were very articulate and fluent, and they were very surprised by how ready he was to talk about everything they wanted to know. Why and how, and he was happy to explain everything. To them, he seemed strangely coherent for somebody who tried to eat someone else. They certainly didn't think he was insane. I just uh, wonder if this had all happened um, post Silence of the Lambs, whether the perception of a cannibal would have been changed. Because pre uh, Hannibal Lecter, you've got, uh, you know, savages and wild, you know, unevolved mm. people who are associated with being cannibals. But here we've got this guy who's articulate he's from yeah. a foreign land but yeah he speaks fluent french and mm-hmm. it's you know it's it's so yeah. you know it was obviously Possible. just a, a snap he's not really a cannibal it must there must be some other explanation yeah it could be yeah during the time sagawa was awaiting trial the judge a very famous judge at the time decided to go to japan to investigate what drove sagawa to murder and to cannibalism <laughs> So he interviewed his family, psychiatrists that had talked to Segawa after the attack on the German girl. But he decided that there just wouldn't be an easy answer. He just couldn't find a good explanation for what he did. Nobody knew, nobody understood what was happening in his head. Those who were close to him and had interacted with him couldn't pinpoint anything that would explain what he was trying to do. Well, you're trying to, once again, trying to create a, a frame of sanity on insanity and that never works but the judge needed to know because yeah. if he's insane he can't be tried so he needed mm. to know what made him do it mm. so he wanted an explanation for it and he just he didn't find one in japan so after two years awaiting, awaiting trial Segura was found not responsible for his actions but for reason of insanity the psychiatrist that examined him attribute his total lack of inhibition and Part of his behavior to an encephalitis he caught at age two. Right. Which apparently he miraculously survived. So that's uh, swelling of the So swelling of the brain, yeah. The, well, br- the, the brain. Around the brain. Around the brain, yeah. They also think that after that he was forced to eat by his mum, who saw eating as the only way he would survive. Because remember, it was tiny and Yeah, so feeding him up and, and making him strong. Yeah, yeah yes, exactly. Okay, fair enough. And he remembers that from seven years old, he was obsessed with eating people. <laughs> so he, very early, he remembers. I, I don't remember that, Freud, you know, when you go through your, your fecal stage and then you go through your cannibalism yeah, stage. No. I must have missed that stage yeah. out. So they, they therefore declare him unfit for trial. 
and instead he's sentenced to be committed to a mental institution indefinitely. Right, that's fine. In Vildrif, okay. where my parents live. Oh, God, that's frightening. We drove past it many times. Every time we go to see them by car, we drove, we drive past the mental hospital. Oh, my God. <laughs> so he was in there. I'm going to get eaten in the middle of the night the next time we visit the yes. in-laws. At some point, the Japanese author visits him uh-huh. in Paris, and he publishes the account of what they've talked about yes. in a book called In the Fog. At that point, he gets some kind of celebrity status. And it probably played a role in the French authorities' dis- the decision to deport him to Tokyo. Right. So when to he complete goes his sentence. To, so he goes to Japanese prison then. Yeah, that was the deal. Mm-hmm. But once there, he was first committed to a, a hospital for evaluation by a psychiatrist. Right. Who all decided he was sane. Yes. And therefore they couldn't keep him. Yeah, I knew that was coming. That they, just makes my blood boil as well. Yeah, they attribute his sole motivation for murder to some kind of weird sexual perversion. So they can't keep him in a mental hospital. But he ate somebody, but they can't keep him locked up. Yeah, because he's not mm. insane. Yeah. But sure. because the charges were dropped in France, because he was insane, yeah. they couldn't try him in Japan because there was no crime. And because the re- records were sealed, the Japanese authorities, because he was insane again, couldn't get any anything to even try to 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 mm. sentence him to anything. I'm sure the Rennie family were Rennie's family were all fine with this, and they yeah. they were mm-hmm. you know it's, it's okay. We understand. So apparently, it's a loophole international law. Um, <sighs> if there's no charges, of course, in the original country, you can't be tried in your destination country, or whatever the, the country. That the is. problem is there's always bloody loopholes for for the wealthy and the super wealthy. Yeah. That's always the way it is. So he was freed on the 12th of August, 1986. For Christ's sake. The investigation into his motivation has come up with some kind of background story. Sagawa had an uncle called Mitsuo, who for New Year's festivities in Japan would disguise himself as a child-eating giant. And he would be... It would be up to Sagawa's father to protect his children. He has a brother. Uh, Sagawa has a brother. Right. What's weird is that inevitably the giant would win. So the child the eating giant would eaten. always win against Sagawa's father. Oh, right. Okay. Yes, I see. Right. So he's protecting his kids. Yeah, right. Yeah. So the giant would, fir- would always first blank Sagawa's father and then kill him. It's all a bit e- Oedipal, isn't it? In reverse. Yes. Yeah. Sagawa and his father would, and his brother would then be snatched up by the giant, ready to be eaten in a very large uh, cast iron cooking pot. Of course. Sagawa remembers the elation and excitement of the two boys being ready to be eaten and all that. So it was very exciting for him. So that, so that is the, the theory how he became obsessed yes. with eating. Eating people. Human flesh. Yes. Later on, once he could read, he kept an eye out for any book or fairy tale about humans eating, being eaten by monsters or dragons or other people. And as you can guess, the tale of Hansel and Gretel was one yeah. of his favorites. Mm-hmm. He would stay awake for hours uh, replaying these tales in his mind at night, thinking about fattening children and eating them. Maybe that's why he's got a fascination with Northern Europeans. Yeah, possibly. Because, I mean, that's where the story comes from. Yeah, eventually it became linked to his sexual awakening, awakening mm. and he turned into, um, like, uh, BDSM practices and, and all that. And he liked to be manhandled, and you can imagine. Well, I try not to, but, yeah. At school, he was very shy. Uh, he knew his obsession of eating people would not go down well with other kids. Knew they would mock him and calling him a, a weirdo. So he didn't mix much with the other kids. And instead he concentrated on learning and schoolwork. And that's how he became so erudite and knowledgeable. Yeah, he, lots of things. he was certainly self For being a weirdo, he was very self-aware. He was aware of the consequences of what he was thinking. Yes, definitively. But and that's probably why they found him not insane in Japan. Yes. Yeah, because, because he, he managed clearly to... knew what oh, he yes. was doing. Oh, he wasn't insane. He yeah, was just exactly. fucked up. Yeah. 
So that's where his interest in German literature comes from, probably. Yeah, I would, answering think so. I would think so. The Grimm brothers have a lot to answer. Yeah. Over time, he became obsessed with Western, very pale women um, that came, he came to see as angels. And he developed a taste for Renoir women. Oh, I see. So the so very yeah, ethereal looking. Yeah. Kind of super pale. pale. Yeah. Yeah. At age fifteen, he contacted a, psychiat- a psychiatrist because at some point he his fantasies started to incorporate murder, and that disturbed him. Well, so yeah. it wasn't just eating people. At that point, it became killing people, and it got scared. But generally, one leads to the other. Well, one requires the other to happen, yes. You can't eat someone unless they're dead. Unless you're very neatly amputating their limbs. Yeah. And just eating the the legs and arms. Like the pig in uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yes. Yeah. Or Homer, once again. There's a treehouse of horrors where he ends up eating himself entirely. (laughs) Yes. So he was informed by the psychiatrist that to make any progress, he needed to come to a face-to-face consultation, mm-hmm. and he was too embarrassed and shy to do that, so he just gave up on that. Well, that could have been a chance to head it off at the pass. That's, a, that's yes. unfortunate, yeah. After he tried to kill the, Ger- the German woman in Tokyo, yeah. he contacted another psychiatrist again, and he was convinced to attend a face-to-face meeting with him. But after he told the psychiatrist what had happened the previous night, he was told that he was a dangerous to society and had crossed an unacceptable boundary. That's not the answer he wanted. So again, he gave up. Never oh, going what back. was he just wanting to hear what he wanted to hear? Not necessarily, but I think he, was, he wanted help. Yes. And all, all he got is blame uh, from the psychiatrist saying that you're a weirdo, you're a, yeah, you're well, a monster, yeah, you should that, never yeah, have done that. You, the, that's not what he wanted. What the he colour wanted. draining from your face and saying, wow, that's yeah, fucked up, dude. It, exactly. What he wanted was help, mm. and he didn't get that. So after those years, he went to Paris, and everything happened in Paris. For so we're, few, back, we're, we're in Tokyo now. We're, we're, we're back in Tokyo after Paris now. Right. After a few years, uh, he... He enjoyed a few uh, years of fame and yeah. celebrity. He went mm-hmm. to TVs, TV interviews and yeah. all that. Really he was making money it. out of it, basically. No, he wasn't. Was he not? No, no, no he wasn't making money. Uh, he even appeared in an ad for a meat restaurant. What the When, when what? I read that, I thought, what, Japan, what the fuck, Japan? Yeah, oh my God. So, yeah. Um, that's pretty much the only time he made money because he tried to write books, but they weren't successful. Um, there's just no, nothing came out of it in terms of money for him. In '85, uh, the French magazine Paris Match published the crime scene photos. Oh my God! Uh, Why? You, can, you can find them online if you want no, to see I what don't think we will Rene would look like after dinner. No, I don't think we'll be putting that up on our website. No. Thank you very much. But they are very easy to find. Sagawa's parents died in 2005. Mm. And once Sagawa paid all the creditors, he ended up with no money whatsoever left from his parents. So they were rich, but kind of rich on credit. Yeah, rich tried to bail him out, his crazy ass out yeah. of uh, jail. So he lived on benefits for a while. Right. So that's what I'm saying, he made no money. He was okay. actually living on benefits. Okay. And in housing estates in Japan. Mm-hmm. He said in an interview to Vice in 2011 that being forced to make a living because he had no money from his parents while being known as the cannibal and the murderer, was a terrible punishment. Oh, boo-hoo. Oh, my heart bleeds for you. Oh, yeah. don't tell him that I want to eat it. But He wrote several more books, mostly centered around his crime, but it's just they weren't, they weren't selling. Nobody was interested. Well, he, that's good. He died in 2022, in December, so not long ago, Yeah. from complication from pneumonia. The building where he lived... Right, in Paris. In Rondesmont 16. Yeah, burned down in 2019, and 10 people died in it. Oh, no. And I think I remember that fire. I bet they're saying that building's cursed. That was my next sentence. Yes. (laughs) And that's it. That's the story of the Paris cannibal. Parisian cannibal, eh? Do you know what, cannibal? You're not getting a quick court, a quippy line. I just don't approve of just that story at all. Um, it's just disgusting. My thoughts go out to uh, to Rennie's family, because I think when everyone tells the story, they don't focus on her. 
and uh, fuck him. <laughs>